now we're moving on to the next chapter. We're talking about the adaptive immune response. And so remember that the really cool thing about this is that it, it adapts and changes over our lifetime. And probably one of the coolest components of it is the, be able to, the ability to remember what it's exposed to. Um, and the specificity involved in this. So remember the term antigen, and we're going to talk a little bit more detail about antigens and, and how important and how we respond to these. And then we're going to talk about my favorite protein in existence, um, antibodies, right? And their amazing abilities and all the different types that um, we have and we produce. So you need to be able to distinguish between an antigen and an epitope. And sometimes epitopes are referred to as antigenic determinants, but I always stick to epitopes. Um, and so we're going to watch a short animation um, and helping us distinguish between what we refer to as when we say antigen as opposed to when we get a little bit more specific and we say epitope. Antigens are macromolecules, usually of molecular weight greater than 10,000, such as proteins and polysaccharides. They are recognized by the immune system as foreign. Individual antibodies are not made against the entire antigen molecule, but rather to particular chemical groups on the molecules known as antigenic determinants or epitopes. Many different antibodies can be made against a single antigen, each antibody reacting with a different epitope. <laughs> Complex structures, such as the surfaces of bacterial cells, may have many different epitopes. Each different antibody binds only to the correct epitope. So as it relates to epitopes, we're talking about specifically, right down to the molecular level, where an antibody is binding. And because antigens themselves can be quite complex, as you see here, we can actually produce multiple antibodies against the same antigen. Right. So we're not going to just make one. We're going to make as many as we possibly can that will recognize that antigen. And antigens, you can see, can be as small as, as a protein, but proteins still, at the molecular level, have quite a bit of diversity um, where we could produce multiple antibodies against a single protein even because this interaction is, is, is a very small interaction because um, it's down to the molecular level. So in the case of this first picture, rewind, right? This could be like 10 amino acids in that one section of the, of the protein that that particular antibody is binding to. So remember, antigen actually stands for antibody generators um, because when we had foreign substances that entered the body, we got this antibody response. Now, we know now that's not the only way we respond, right? As we've seen with innate response, I mean, we can get complement activation, we can get phagocytic cells, we can get inflammation, We, depending on what it is. If it's a virus, we could get interferon. There's lots of different ways that we're going to respond. But one of the ways if it goes to the adaptive immune response is the production of antibodies. So today, typically, um, although even myself as an immunologist haven't really switched over to using this term, um, sometimes we say immunogen instead of antigen. So referring that the immune system makes a response against it. So in that case, you know, we're not really being specific and saying, oh, you know, it's an antigen, so we're going to make antibodies. You know, we're saying it's an immunogen. It's something that's foreign to our body, and so our immune system is going to respond. So proteins and polysaccharides, as they mentioned, um, are really good antigens. Um, a lot of times they'll induce what's referred to as the string response. Um, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later when we look at how, you know, antibody production gets activated. Uh, lipids and nucleic acids um, often do not. And, and the problem with that is, is really not a lot of variability in those molecules, right? With proteins, you get a lot of variability 
um, putting those 20 different amino acids together in, in different combinations really can create a lot of variability. There's lots of sugars out there, right, polysaccharide sugars, um, where lipids don't have a lot of variability to them. Um, and nucleic acids, there's the issue too, right, that we have nucleic acid too, so it's going to be different from us. Um, and for the most part, you know, there's very few differences between pathogens, nucleic acids, and our own. Um, so that makes it really hard to um, detect those subtle differences that may exist. So recognition of the antigen uh, directed at the little pieces, right? Because the antibodies don't bind to the whole thing. They bind to the little pieces, what we call the epitopes, where the antibody is actually binding. So proteins, as I said, usually nice, strong response. Lipids, a weaker response. Smaller molecules are usually not antigenic, right? It's going to be big enough that an antibody can bind to it um, and that the immune system can recognize and detect it as being foreign. So as I said earlier, right, they can, antibodies can bind with about 10 amino acids or so. So relatively small, um, three-dimensional shapes, and bacteria are going to have a multitude of different uh, antigenic determinants or epitopes. So when you zoom in on this bacteria, you know, some of them are um, interacting with the cell surface, others are interacting with the papillae um, and components of those proteins sticking out of the cell. So that brings us to these beautiful proteins that we make, right, that bind to these epitopes that we call antibodies. So the structure of the antibody is really important to its functionality, like how it works. So we need to be able to know the different parts and the terminology related to the different parts of an antibody. So um, we're going to do a little activity with that. using our poll. So let's see, I should go to my next one. Yeah. So this, again, you have to be able to, for this one you can't do texting, right? You got to have a smartphone, you got to do the web browser, you got to do the pollev.com. And so which one of these, and you should be able to click right on it, touch it, um, the green or the blue, what's the light chains? All right. So most of you guys are getting it right, yay. So you could have went over here too, by the way, right? There's another half of the light chains that's over here. So light chains, there are two, and heavy chains, there are two. Um, and they get their name from the fact that one is smaller than the other, so therefore it's lighter than the other. The others are larger. So you have two identical light chains on either side of the antibody, and they're denoted in blue on this diagram. And then the green are the two heavy chains, and they're much longer, right? They go the entire length of the antibody. So they are proteins, right? So in the DNA, it's coded on how to make the heavy chain proteins, and it'll make two of them, and how to make the light chain proteins, and it'll make two. So this, this molecule is basically a mirror image of itself. So we'll go to the next one. And I'll deploy it. So when they were studying antibodies, um, they broke them apart into different pieces. You know, they broke the heavy chains and the light chains up. 
And that's how they were able to see, well, some of them are bigger, heavier than others, and others are lighter. Well, then they treated the protein in a different way, and they were able to break, break it into these three fractions, right? The A fraction, the B fraction, and the C fraction. So guess which one is the FC region? The one that has a C, right? It's really that simple. Um, C actually stands for crystallized. So this, this portion of the antibody, this bottom portion here, that's made up of part of the heavy chains, notice. This portion here crystallized when they did this fractioning that they did. These other two pieces that I have labeled A and B here, are referred to as the fractions, and notice again, they're the same. They have part heavy chain, part light chain, and they're just mirror images, right, of each other. This is the part that binds to antigen. So they're named the fractions A, B, for antigen binding. Um, but it works out, right, because we end up with A, B, C. <laughs> but this portion is very important, right, which is why I wanted you guys tagging this one. This FC portion is what our immune system responds to. If you remember from the first animation that we looked at, where did the complement proteins bind? They bonded to this FC region, this almost what sometimes is referred to as the stem, right, and these two parts that stick up or sometimes referred to the arms, right? So a lot of times you'll see, and we'll see even today, that phagocytic cells have FC receptors. Well, what are they talking about? They're talking about the fact that that phagocyte can grab on to this C portion, this C region, this FC region of an antibody. So one more. Are all antibodies the same? No, they're similar. But in order for them to bind to all those different epitopes, each antibody that binds to that epitope is different. Right? The antibody that binds to one epitope is different from the antibody that binds to a different epitope. So where is that difference? Where is that variability in an antibody? Is it in the green region or the blue region? Where does each antibody differ from one another? Where is it variable? Where does it change? Oh, I didn't deploy it. You guys didn't yell at me. <laughs> She'd be like, I can't click. Okay. So, yeah, you guys are right. It's the green region. Because remember, what did we say? These parts are the parts that are going to bind to the antigen. So these parts, and notice that the variable region has part of a light chain is different, and the heavy chains have a variable region. Both of the proteins that we make to make up this antibody, both the heavy and light chains, both have a variable region. In the region that interacts with the antigens. But this is the same, right? One antibody molecule, these two sides, they're the same, they're just mirror images of each other. They're going to bind to the exact same epitope on an antigen. These two arms, you could say, of the antibody. So let's switch back to our PowerPoint now. And several times I've complained about the way they diagrammed it in their book. I think they've improved it a little bit. <laughs> 
So two identical arms, right? These make up the antigen binding regions. So the antigens are going to bind here at the tops of the arms. The stem portion, known as the FC region, right, again, because it crystallized. Antibodies themselves, in my diagrams, are better, so I'm going to go to that. So to give you an example of how I could possibly ask you this on an exam, I could label all the different parts as I've done here, right, with letters in a picture like this. Or I could give you any of those other pictures we've been clicking on, right, and I could label them with letters, right, or descriptions, and you would have to be able to tell me what it is that I'm referring to. So um, in the case of antigen binding sites, they're represented here by M and N. And so as you see here, right, the tips, the arms, is where it binds to an antigen. So here's an example of a bacteria with antibodies bound to it. And those antibodies are binding to those specific epitopes that it, they, that antibody recognizes. So again, A and B are antigen binding sites. C down here, this is, this is the portion that the immune cells are going to interact with or complements going to interact with, right? Our immune system recognizes this bottom portion, this stem or FC region. So remember, our light chains, we have two of them. They're identical. They're smaller. That's why they're lighter. And then we have our two represented in green here, heavy chains. So when our cells are making these molecules, they make two heavy chain proteins and two light chain proteins, and then they put them together in this orientation. Because of that, these top portions, right, are mirror images of each other and are going to be our FAB regions, antigen binding regions. And then we have our FC, which actually stood for crystallization. Um, but this is what our immune system interacts with. In order for each antibody to be different and be able to bind to different epitopes, there has to be some variability in this molecule. So that, as we've already pointed out, is the top portion here of the FAB region for both the light and heavy chains. Those are your variable regions. That's what's going to change from antibody to antibody so that it can bind to different antigens, specifically different epitopes on antigens. The rest of this, it's shown here in blue, is referred to as constant region. What does constant mean? It stays the same, right? So why do you think it needs to stay the same? What do you notice about the structure of this molecule? Where do the heavy and light chains bind with each other? It's in this constant region, right? You see this sulfide disulfide bond? So the light chains will not attach to the heavy chains to form this, this structure, this overall Y structure, unless this stays the same, right? If you change this, there's no guarantee that the heavy and the light chains are going to bind to each other. Right? So we need consistency in this region so that the two heavy and light chains will bind. And then, of course, here in the hinge region, we need the two heavy chains to bind with each other so that we get this characteristic Y shape, which is very important to its functionality, right? Because it's the combination of the light and heavy chains that give us this variability in the antigen binding site. And it's going to be this relative consistency that we have with the heavy chain that's going to allow the immune system to recognize our own antibodies. So the structure is very important to its functionality. Now, granted, this is a stick figure, right? Like we draw human stick figures. <laughs> um, they don't look like this. They're globular structures, um, but overall they look like a Y, right? They're going to have the two stems, and they're going to have the two arms and the stem. 
I don't know if did you did they show you guys a three dimensional like picture in the book? No. No. It's okay. You can look up on the internet. <laughs> All right. Just know that this is a this is a stick drawing, right? This is not what the real thing looks like. It's like people don't look like stick drawings. Okay. How are we? I know it's a lot, right? <laughs> it's a lot. Okay. So, again, if I was to give you the answers to these, right, without any of that shading and stuff other than for heavy and light chains, you should be able to um, say which is which, right? Um, what regions are what. Now, this is an example of how important that um, FC region is and a prelude to some of the other stuff that we're going to talk about today. So, this is a mast cell. Notice it's got a receptor on its surface. This is what we would call an FC receptor, right? Because, again, notice what portion of the antibody is it binding to. It's binding to the FC region. There's a particular class of antibodies that we produce called IgE. I always joke with my students that you shouldn't have any trouble remembering this one. And, you know, how appropriate that either I'm sick or experiencing allergies today, that I sound like a frog. Um, so I always tell my students, remember E for Erica, because Erica hates her allergies. So it always helps you remember that IgE is related to allergies. <laughs> um, and so there's five different classes of antibodies that we produce, and our immune system responds to each class a little bit differently, and each class has a little bit different job. Um, and that, that distinction of what class of antibody it is, is again that FC region. This constant region um, of the heavy chain, this fraction or region, is going to determine what class of the five that we're talking about and really how the immune system is going to respond to that particular antibody. So before we get to all the different classes, we're going to talk about, well, okay, this is great. You know, we've got an antibody. It specifically binds, I mean, right down to the molecular level, an, an epitope on an antigen. So it binds to it. Big whoop to do, right? How is that beneficial to us, right? That an antibody will specifically bind to an antigen. Well, one of the ways is when it binds to viruses or toxins, we, it has this protective outcome that we give what name to. We basically stop them from being bad guys, right? We stop these toxins and viruses from being bad guys. This process is called neutralization, right? So we've neutralized them, right? How is it that we've neutralized them? What do viruses have to do to make us sick? What's the very first step they need to do? They need to attach to ourselves, right? They literally attach, right? Their proteins interact with the proteins on our cells, the receptors on our cells. Can they do that in this picture? Now, what's stopping them from being able to attach to us? What are these? What are these little red Ys? These are the antibodies, right? They're binding specifically to that virus, binding specifically to this toxin. So now the toxin can't attach to our cells. It can't do the very first thing it has to do to be a bad guy. It can't attach. So we've neutralized it. We've stopped him from causing any problems by creating that barrier, right? The antibody basically creates a barrier between the virus and our cells, between the toxin and our cells. So as you can see, right, if we can get our immune system to make antibodies, 
against toxins, against viruses, it can be very beneficial to us. So one of the ways we expose our body to antigens in a relatively safe manner in order to get it to produce antibodies is what? What do you do every year against the flu? You get vaccinated. What do they do? They give you viruses so that your body will make what? Antibodies. The tetanus vaccine, guess what? They're giving you a, a modified form of the toxin that that bacteria produces. So guess what you make against the toxin? What are we talking about today, y'all? Wake up. Make antibodies. We make antibodies. So we can neutralize that toxin if it gets in us. So, I don't know about you guys. Just on that one, I'm like, yeah, I'm totally in love with antibodies, right? These suckers are cool. <laughs> they can really protect us at a very specific level, right? You, can, you make antibodies specifically against that toxin produced by tetanus, which is a really mean toxin. It's a bad guy. What is, what is being shown by this picture? What's happening here? So we've got, say, a bacteria, right? We've got antibodies coating it, and then what is this, probably? That's a cell nucleus, but what, what type of cell is this? What is it doing? It's probably a macrophage, right? It's phagocytosing this complex. How did it know to eat this bacteria? It has receptors for what is coating that bacteria? Antibodies. When we coat something with a protein that we produced that's going to trigger phagocytic cells to literally phagocytose and destroy it, this process is called what? It starts with an O. This is opsonization. And then as I said, right, our cells have receptors for that portion of our antibody, though. You see, that portion, the FC portion, that's what it's grabbing onto. They're not showing you the receptors here, but trust me, that's how he's grabbing on. So there's one other protein that we produce, right, that's a complement protein that opsonizes antigens. So let's see how quick you guys can answer that poll. As quick as I can get it up, right? So what complement protein? So it's going to be C, a number, and I'll give you a clue. It also has a, another letter. What's the opsonizer for complement? <coughs> you got to know this one. So it's C... What number and what letter? This one is not in the right order, right? <laughs> Should be C3A. This, that would be correct, right? C referring to complement, three the number, right? And A referring to that fragment. So you guys have got the number right, I'll tell you that. The threes have it. Ooh, but we're battling between the A or the B. Who should win this one? The B should win. Because remember what I told you guys, B for... Binding will help you remember it's the B that's important for optimization. Okay. So, there you have it. Oop, I went too fast. C3B. B for binding. So, antibodies, which are very specific, 
or a little bit non-specific, right? Because it's a product of our innate immune response complement. C3B can help phagocytic cells know that this guy needs to be destroyed. So notice here too that it was specific as to a particular class of antibodies. So another name for antibodies is immunoglobulins. We'll get to this in a moment. So that's commonly abbreviated IG. And then the second letter that you'll see, like IgE, or in this case IgG, refers to the class. And there's five different classes that we're going to talk about in a moment. If we get to them today, we might. So, this is familiar, right? <laughs> Which protective outcome of antigen antibody binding is represented here? The outcomes of this protective outcome would be opsonization by C3B, inflammatory response, lysis of foreign cells. What is this? What system is going to give you these outcomes? C, C, C. Complement, right? Activation of complement. So another quiz for you guys, what other letters and, and numbers from complement do we need to know? There are two of them for this one. Which ones are important for initiating inflammatory response? Alright, so we have two correct answers for this one. So inflammatory response, C, what letter, what C, what number, and what letter? <coughs> Did I not deploy it? No. Nope. I remember that darn button. We're doing good. We got the numbers. We got to decide on these letters though, right? After the C. Is it the A's or is it the B's? Ah, A. So Carlos said A, activate, right? Um, or sometimes anaphylaxis, um, which is a term that's used for inflammation. So yes, the A's are who should have it. So it's C3A and C5A are your correct answers for this one. Remember, those were the major players, again, when we looked at the complement cascade today. So that's it for the letters and the numbers from complement that you need to memorize. And as to who does what. That might be my last poll, is it? Oh, we got one more coming up in a bit. All right. So what's this one? So we've got bacteria here. What do you think these things sticking out of the bacteria are? They're flagella. They're flagella. So they use those for what? Mobility. So what happens if antibodies bind to those flagella like you see here? They're not going to be able to move, right? This is going to impair their mobility, okay? Um, so uh, when I was in grad school helping out one of my colleagues uh, going down the bayou, right, taking samples, um, she was studying fish parasites, so we were cleaning out fish traps uh, for her to be able to study the parasites that the fish had. All of a sudden we're going down the bayou and we stop, right? We're not going anywhere. So we pull up the motor, like what's wrong? There's a 
there is a sweatshirt wrapped around the propeller of the motor. Right? So we're like tearing this old sweatshirt off the motor's propeller so that we can continue down the bayou. So imagine these poor bacteria. I mean, their, their flagella are their propeller to their boat, right? If you wrap something up like an antibody around that, is it going to be able to propel them? No, it's going to impede their mobility. And then also, bacteria can have little tiny protein appendages. They can sometimes use for motility, but mainly they use them for what? They're called fimbri. What are they using them for? Attachment, right? So again, like we saw with viruses and toxins, if antibodies bind, they can get in the way of attachment. So this one can be twofold for this. It can immobilize them, but it also can prevent them from adhering to us. Now they're not using their flagella to adhere to us, but their fimbri, they could be using to adhere to us and they can also use for motility. Right? Um, so fimbri are specialized papillae, usually specifically for just attachment. So papillae. <laughs> then our next outcome you've got an antigen, say a bacteria here. And the cool thing about antibodies is they have at least two antigen binding sites, right? So what do you see here? This antibody is actually binding to how many antigens? <coughs> one here and one here, right? So this is referred to as cross-linking. We can clump them up. Now, there's two types of clumping that can happen that they don't go over in your book. So we create these big complexes, right? It makes it much easier for phagocytic cells, right, if we kind of clump them all together in an area to be able to gobble them up and destroy them. You, if you've taken Anatomy and Physiology 2 lab, have done this type of reaction outside of the body. You've taken antibodies against known antigens present on red blood cells and have added that to red blood cells to try and determine if that red blood cell has that antigen that the antibody you're using binds to. Right? Blood typing. Okay. That reaction, does anyone know the name of that reaction? Agglutination. Agglutination is referred to as agglutination. Um, so agglutination happens for large things like red blood cells or bacteria. You can cause a different type of reaction when you have cross-linking of antigen and antibodies, these immune complexes forming. If the molecule is soluble, so say something like a protein that can... Um, dissolve into solution. You wouldn't see it. But when antibodies bind to it, it makes it a much larger complex like you see here. And in that case, it would actually fall out of solution. It would precipitate. So that's referred to as a precipitation reaction. Now these really are, are terms that are used for when these reactions happen outside of the body. The important thing inside the body is that antigens and antibodies are binding, they're forming these very large antigen-antibody immune complexes. And it makes, much, makes it much easier for our body to eliminate them if we, if we basically trap them all together. And the reason why we can do this is because, at the very least, as you see here, antibodies have at least two arms. Well, there's one special class of antibody called IgM. And it's actually a pentamer, which means it's five Y structures all together. So as you see here, it looks like an antibody, right? But there are 
five of them hooked together. And these are really good at agglutination type reactions. So again, outside the body, we could put some bacteria on a slide and add antibodies against it. And they'll all clump up, clump up together. And you can actually see that under the microscope for bacteria. With red blood cells, because they're so large, right? You guys don't even need the aid of a microscope. You can do it right on a slide or right in a plastic well. You add those antibodies in the red blood cells like you see here, and they clump up a lot. And the reason for that is the antibody you're using, too, for um, ABO blood typing is a pentamer, is this big, huge IgM. And that's why you get that really good reaction when you're trying to do that type of blood typing. The one um, that you make against the RH is the smaller IgG, just a single little Y. But it still does a pretty good job at clumping it up. So the last protective outcome, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing we will end there today, is this. So notice here we've got a cell. Anyone want to gander a guess as to what this is representing? It's a virus. So you've got a cell infected with a virus. And viruses, a lot especially ones that infect our cells, convert our membranes into their envelopes. And in doing that, they insert their proteins into our membrane. When they do that, remember, these are foreign proteins. If our body's seen this before and made antibodies against it, those antibodies will bind to those foreign proteins inserted into our cell's membrane. When that happens, another cell that can come along and kill it, if it recognizes that these antibodies are bound to one of our cells because it's recognizing antigen, this lymphocyte that's a specialized killer is going to kill this cell. What is that lymphocyte? This is your natural killer. This process is referred to as antibody dependent. So this only happens, the natural killer cell is only going to kill these cells if it's coated in antibody. Cellular, as in it's, it's, it's at a cellular level, and it's cytotoxic. It's going to kill that cell. Remember, out of our lymphocytes, natural killer cells are not antigen-specific. They don't have antigen-specific receptors themselves. In this case, it's using the aid of the antibody to determine that this is a specific bad guy that needs to be destroyed, which happens to be inside of our cells. So I guess we'll have to do our classes next time on our other poll. Okay, um, I didn't change anything to that.